American education would be comic if it were not so tragic in its consequences. Recently, I received a letter from a school teacher asking for an autographed picture for his class because it would ultimately, U L T E M E T L Y, help his students to have me as a role model, R O L L. Atypical? Let us hope so. But a few years ago, a study showed the average verbal scholastic aptitude test score for aspiring teachers to be 389 out of a possible 800. With American school children repeatedly finishing at or near the bottom on international test comparisons, the response of the education establishment has been to seek ever more non-academic adventures to go off on. Among the latest of these innovations, a magic word in the wonderland of educational newspeak, is called outcome-based education. Like so many of the catchphrases that come and go, it means nothing like what it seems to mean. Education based on outcomes might sound to many people like finally creating a bottom line for schools, teachers, and administrators to be judged by. Nothing of the sort. It is yet another way of getting away from academic work and indulging in psychological and ideological indoctrination. This is called advancing beyond rote learning and teaching school children to think. Many in the media gullibly repeat such phrases without the slightest investigation of what concretely they mean in practice. When concrete specifics leak out, there is often shock, as there currently is in California, where tests are intruding into students' family lives and sexual experiences, among other things. The parents who first protested were predictably labeled the religious right, but now even some in the educational establishment itself have begun to express concern. Not long before, parents in Connecticut who objected to film strips of naked couples engaged in sex, both homosexual and heterosexual, being shown in the local junior high school were labeled fundamentalists and right-wing extremists, even though they were in fact affluent Episcopalians. There are all sorts of prepackaged responses to critics of the public schools, of which this was just one. Recently, I got a first-hand dose of these stereotyped responses when addressing a class of students who are being trained for careers as teachers. They seemed disconcerted by the questions I put to them. Suppose you are wrong. How would you know? How would you test for that possibility? The very thought that the dogmas they were repeating with such fervor might be open to question or subject to evidence seemed never to have occurred to them. This was a far more ominous sign than their merely being wrong on particular beliefs. How can they teach anybody else to think if they themselves have not reached this elementary level of logic? By thinking, too many educators today mean teaching children to reject traditions in favor of their own emotional responses. Objections to such propaganda programs are called objections to letting children think. Anything less than a blank check for indoctrination is called censorship. In light of such non-academic activities in our public schools, it can hardly be surprising that American youngsters do so badly on academic tests administered to youngsters around the world. Nor is it surprising that academic work is so readily abandoned for social experiments, ideological crusades, and psychological manipulations by educators whose own academic performances have long been shown to be substandard. It is not uncommon for those few schools with traditional academic programs to have waiting lists of parents who want to get their children admitted. When admission is on a first-come, first-served basis, it is not uncommon for parents to camp out overnight in hopes of getting their children into institutions that will teach them substance instead of fluff and politically correct propaganda. Against this background, Recent campaigns for a longer school day and a longer school year are farcical. If a lack of time is the problem, why are schools wasting so much time on innumerable non-academic activities? Moreover, there is no amount of additional time that cannot be wasted on similar pursuits. 
No small part of the existing problems of the public schools is that the school day is already so long and boring, with so little to challenge the ablest students. Moreover, many average and below average students who have lost all interest are retained by compulsory attendance laws for years past the point where their presence is accomplishing anything other than providing jobs for educators. Despite orchestrated hysteria about the dropout problem, what many apathetic students most need is a cold dose of reality that they can only get out in the workaday world, not in the never-never land of the public schools.